Hello everybody. So lots of stocks to potentially cover today. I just want to go over a few things for, about HIMSS, about Palantir and about Xometry. So let's go with HIMSS. First of all, I was surprised. I could not believe this morning that HIMSS was in the red. It was down 2%. I could not believe this. Um, of course, I, uh, I, I don't have much to add to my video uh, from yesterday, aside from the fact that the call was, well, well, all but one questions were about weight loss. So Wall Street still views this as a mostly, mostly weight loss story. There was only uh, a question about women's health at the very end of the call, but otherwise it was all about weight loss, um, which is unfortunate because, of course, that's a much bigger story than just, just weight loss. Uh, they mentioned in the women's health question, that was very good, they mentioned they had 400,000 customers on that side of the business. And when we analyze hymns, we always forget about that side of the business. That actu that's actually going to be a huge part of the business, I believe. It, I see no reason why it wouldn't be as big as, as hymns. The first part of the business should be as big as hymns. Anyways, let me just talk about weight loss since this was most of the call and I want to comment on the call. So again, celebration time. Liraglutide is coming in early 2025. It will be a generic. They're getting it procured. They will distribute it. They're very happy. And then, of course, they are going to um, keep selling the standard version of compounded semaglutide as long as the shortage is there. And the CEO seems to think that the shortage is still going on and is still there. And it may be uh, protested by pharmacy uh, compounder associations and other folks and other, other players in the business. So, so their conversation says the shortage is still there. And so what happened to Tiozepatide with him, with it being, being back on the list potentially? Well, that could happen with semaglutide being back on the list potentially. But they also made a very good point, and, and we had conversations about this in the comment section, about the fact that they can still sell semaglutide. Can they still sell? sell semaglutide, even if semaglutide is widely available in the United States, can they still sell it? And the answer to that question is very clear, and it is yes, they can still sell compounded semaglutide on the condition that it is a titrated version of semaglutide. And they had way more than 10,000 patients, analysts ask a question about this, but there's way more than 10,000 folks that had a customized customized titrated semaglutide version. Titrated, per my understanding, is just a form of dilution. That's like the best way to say it, but it's a chemistry, uh, chemistry word. And so that has to do with the dosage. And so if you do a custom dose, that, uh, that should still apply as flexibility for compounding. So you should still have clinical flexibility and they should still be allowed to sell a titrated version of semaglutide for cases where customization is indicated to deal with things like side effects, with things like vomiting, etc. The CEO also mentioned on the call that actually uh, GLP-1s, believe it or not, were a major seller for their pill form because a lot of people come on the website hoping to get a GLP-1 and then after one month they find out it's not for them and they downgrade to, say, a metformin-based pill and the way they market that is 70% of the results of GLB-1 for $70. It's kind of a way that they they market it, they, they, they seem to be marketed, marketing that. And I, I could clearly see that catching on because uh, if you study GLB-1, you know, in, in, in the early days, it, it, it was all about trying to make the injection less scary. Injections are still uh, very scary to a lot of people. It's actually a medical condition. I can't, I can't remember what it's called, but there are some people who, you know, they will just pass out if they, if they see a needle. So it's like, it's it's still a major part of the business. And so we are gaining customers like that. Worth mentioning that people, um, they, they tend to see a, a low churn rate on the GLP-1s. They mention an 87% retention rate on GLP-1. So that's actually higher than their legacy products, which was 85% after two years. So GLP-1 has a lot of retention. People like that product. So, you know, the, the analyst, I still think they are misguided only focusing on weight loss. I think they should focus on the whole stack, the entire business. But, you know, it's just the way it is. Um, if you like 
hymns for weight loss, in my view, we had just good news about weight loss. If that's the reason you like the stock, and if you like it for the whole story, well, we didn't have any bad news on the rest of the story. Don't forget that the blockbuster for hymns is still hair loss and ED. That's still like their blockbuster drug. And it's interesting to look at um, the, the, the combination of these drugs and blockbuster drugs, you know, ED drugs were a blockbuster in their day. Today's GLP-1. How many of those are they going to be able to catch up on and, and, and to kind of sell and cater to the market? Um, about the price of HIMSS, again, so today, $22. So it's a little higher on that when I did the screenshot. But anyways, it's still cheap. And the question is, how fast is it going to grow? Do you think it's going to grow at 80% or 60% or 50% or less? Regardless, it's still very cheap in my spreadsheet. EV over GP over RG is a 0, 0.0. Six, seven, five, depending on your assumption. So it's cheap regardless. You know, we, we, we can debate the growth rate, but even if you tell me they're only going to go 25%, I'm still going to find the stock dirt cheap. And that's what happens when you have a company that is, you know, tra trading at, let's call it a 2x sales next year. Two times next year sales is what this company is trading at for a 80% gross margin type business. Let's talk about Palantir. So Palantir is is a is it's well there's a few AI stock I consider Tesla to be an AI stock and I still own all of my Tesla I actually keep adding to Tesla Palantir I'm happy because it's still the one stock that I still own I did sell a part of my Palantir to recoup what I had put in and now I'm playing with the bank's money right I'm playing with the house money and I'm so happy because you know now I don't have to make a decision on Palantir I know I'm never selling it I'm keeping it because it's the house money and 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 you know uh, 50 dollars right 51 for Palantir um, there's no denying that it's an expensive stock I'm not adding to it, right? It's an expensive stock in my view. Um, but, you know, I don't have an issue owning expensive stocks. In fact, if you look at my spreadsheet, uh, Tesla is... Is, is what you know almost I mean I mean it's it's twice as expensive as Palantir if I look at my spreadsheet and I don't have a problem owning Tesla Tesla is is, is, a, is a is a top three position for me um, I don't have a problem owning an expensive company if there is a clear path to domination and you know, for Tesla, I see that. I see that path in the electric uh, vehicle world, in the robotics world, and in the self-driving, especially the self-driving story. For Palantir, is it showing like there is a clear path to not only be a leader in military software, but also a leader in, you know, kind of an ERP 2.0, if I if I would call it, you know, kind of like an, a next gen ERP. Um, could Palantir be the next SAP or the next Salesforce? Well, I believe that's possible. Um, the, the, their software, which is which is based on this idea of ontology, which is a better form of digital twin, their software appears appears to create a tremendous amount of value for old bloated companies with disparate IT systems. And it's kind of like, I mean, Palantir, the way I would describe it is, like, is it's, you know, you, 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 you can turn an old company into the IT of a Tesla or the IT of a Google, you know, Google or Tesla, they have their own IT. With Palantir, you can kind of turn your old world company into a company that, that could be potentially as efficacious as a Google or as a Tesla in its, in its IT. And then as a result of that, what would happen if, if people catch on that software and they seem to have a lot of ease in selling the software through their bootcamp selling strategy. Um, if that catches on, then you have, you have a software Software that could could become a commodity type software where you know it's not it's not do you want to have Palantir? It's just it's more like if you don't have Palantir, are you going to be able to compete? Because they see, they are taking a very different approach to the business. So so what do they do? And and you know in the call at some point they talked about how. AI agents are about to, are able to replace something like 2,000 people uh, for some uh, company. Later in the call, they talk about that. Um, but, you know, they talk about how underwriting, for example, for an, for an, for an insurance company, uh, the underwriting time, the response time was able to move from two weeks from three hours. And so, you know, the question is when you automate everything, how much value can you unlock? Because all of a sudden, your organization is not siloed anymore. You don't have just thousands thousands of employees sitting around, all of a sudden you have a handful of highly, highly, highly performant employees that can just leverage the software to run the business and they seem to be able to generate 
unlock enormous savings for your customer. And so if Palantir shows up and in a matter of a few months they serve they save you $30 million, how much are you gonna pay? Is it worth paying $5 million if when the company shows up they save you $30 million in three months? Right, and how much is that saving over a year or over a ten-year period? So they seem to have a, an easy sell. They seem to be a, having a lot of traction, and of course, I don't cover it in the detail because it's let's let's face it. If you go on YouTube, it's the second most ever stocked after Tesla. So there's a lot of info. But Palantir, the way I view Palantir, it, it turns any old, bloated, old world company into a company that's run like a modern day Google or like a modern day Tesla. And how do they do that? Well, they have their software. It's a three layer software with the core of that software being what they call the ontology, which is a form of a digital twin. And what happens is that you take hundreds of disparate tools and you connect all of these hundreds of disparate tools, you connect them to Foundry and then they are going to take a different spot in Foundry depending on what they are. And then you're going to have your digital twin. So you're going to recreate a digital version of a business. And so when you make a decision, you can know the impact of your de- of your decision on all of the rest of the business. Um, and you can all obviously have the models, have the ontology, have the AI help you make the best decision. And so this is this is part of this story, the, the move from, say, a language model, from an employee having a conversation with a language model about what's the best strategy, you move from a language model to an action model and sure enough the software is slowly and slowly taking action so if you believe in the in the core proposition that a lot of companies are going to be run by ai at some point you know just like when you order something on amazon when you order something on amazon there's no human in the loop it's all it's all a machine right it's you're just talking to a machine and everything except perhaps last mile delivery everything has no humans in the loop. It's just machines. And so if you believe in that future where companies are going to be more and more AI power, I believe Palantir is a, is a great play. That's that's my play. My, my view is, is it, could, it, could, it could be the next Salesforce or the next SAP if you go back further out in time. And Again, the, the performance of this stock is, is beyond beyond my wildest dreams when I was covering it. Uh, you know, they they uh, yeah they were people were people were yeah. Anyways, it's 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 an outstanding stock. Very happy to own it. I'm owning it for a long run. I'm not adding to it. No financial advice, of course. It's just me who thinks it's great. You don't have to agree. It's expensive. Uh, it's obviously expensive. And the last one is Xometry. So Xometry, is it time for me to buy? I still haven't, I mean, I'm, I I mean, I, I don't know. I don't think I'm going to buy Xometry. I haven't pulled the trigger. I've followed that stock for over a year now. And, you know, when I, when I look at my spreadsheet, I try to look at over network effect stock. So Xometry is, is this, this, this classic two, um, you know, two-party um, business model of network, network business models, you know, it's like Uber, Uber, which came first? Is it the riders that come first or is it the drivers that come first? Well, to grow the, the platform, you have to grow both sides of a transaction at about the same speed and at about the same time, because otherwise you're going to have your one side or another side that's unhappy. These businesses take a long term, uh, t- take, take, a, take a long time to figure out. This is nothing against Xometry. It seems like a great business. They have clearly a core and they have a moat and, you know, they are embedded with all of the CAD software. It's just that for me, the growth is just, the growth is just too slow. That's, that's all, that's all there is to say. The growth is, the growth is just too slow. I mean, sure, international is growing at 55% year over year. But um, it's still a teeny tiny part of their of their revenue, right? The the revenue for for Xometry, they have five hundred million in revenue per year, right? Twenty four million in a quarter. That's that's not that's not really that's not really gonna do it, right? They have they still have less than twenty percent of their revenue coming international. That's growing faster than the revenue um, in the U.S. But the revenue in the U.S. doesn't get me excited because it's growing at twenty two percent. So in my spreadsheet, I put it. At a forward growth of 19%, which which you know doesn't doesn't again it 
it's 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 just too slow. If the growth is just too slow, you know, it's like there's only so many stocks you can own, and and the growth in my view for Xometry is just too slow. And when I ask the question, how much am I paying for that growth at Xometry? Well, I'm paying a 0.33. That's that's expensive for a company that is still not positive in EBITDA margin. Again, it's it's this is an expensive stock. You're paying five times. I mean, it's not expensive, but relative to the cheap stocks that we can find in 15 other different sectors that I that I cover on the spreadsheet, that I cover on Patreon, that I cover on the channel, relative to all of the other options, um, a networks are an expensive sector. They're an expensive sector because of a moat built into the network, and a lot of people catch on to that and the whole winner take most. Sorry, but then b even relative to the cost of other companies in, in in the network space, and I'm just showing four out of I think I have maybe 15 in that row on, on the spreadsheet. It is. It is. It, it is not the cheapest, right? The, right now, my favorite network of X stock is GigaCloud, which is a drop shipping company uh, for furniture. That's my favorite network effect stock. But you know, these network effect stocks very expensive. Look at Airbnb. Look at Spotify, right? Very expensive. Uber is expensive. Lyft is expensive. DoorDash is expensive. So anyways, I'll be covering more network FX stock because I am working on a video on Grab, uh, Grab, which is a Singaporean uh, delivery company. So I will be covering more of the network FX stock. Right now, it's great. The stock is up 20%, but, but to me, the growth is still too slow. So anyways, this was not financial advice, not investment advice, just entertainment. Hoping you were entertained. Please like, please subscribe. Thank you for watching and have a wonderful day.